Xenophanes lived a long life, approximately 570 to 470 BC. He's from Colophon, which is an area in what we now know as Western Turkey, so near where the first Milesian philosophers worked, and Heraclitus from Ephesus in that area. One of the things he did initially was a cultural criticism of sort, where he compared athletes to philosophers, and Xenophanes bemoans the glorification of athletes, that they are given all these accolades, they're provided food, uh, while those who have wisdom are not given similar respect. And though he's interested in the cosmological issues of the Milesians, so he does talk about where things come from, for example, how things came to be the way they are in a physical sense. He was not primarily a natural philosopher. That wasn't his main concern. When he compares philosophers to athletes, he talks about how athletes don't really help a society run well, but a philosopher who could understand political theory and apply that would be much more valuable, and that's part of his criticism. Xenophanes began to apply philosophy to religion, and he gave a rational criticism of religious beliefs, the beliefs of his contemporaries, those that were found in the writings of Homer and Hesiod and were very common and popular at his time. So uh, much of what I will focus on in this video has to do with religion, because that's where Xenophanes was significant and contributed significantly uh, and originated some of the ideas here. First of all, he criticized religion by saying that the explanatory value of appealing to the gods had decreased. So by doing natural philosophy and the other natural philosophers that preceded him, he said we can explain a lot of the natural phenomena that people normally attribute to Zeus or Apollo or Poseidon or other gods doing certain things to cause these phenomena. One of the reasons people believed in the gods is because of their role in explaining natural phenomena. So if you can, going back to Thales explaining a solar eclipse, if you can explain it without appealing to anthropomorphic gods, then you are showing the rational nature of the universe. And Xenophany says, we don't need religion to do that anymore. That was no longer necessary. Another criticism of religion is that the gods were not worthy of an exalted status. In the culture, of course, they had temples and were doing sacrifices and, and so on. But Xenophany says, look, the gods that we are familiar with, they're not morally worthy. They have all the negative moral traits of humanity. They lie, they cheat, they have affairs, they steal things. They, they have these attributes, according to the poets, that make them not morally worthy of our devotion and our worship. In addition, they're not metaphysically worthy since they're born. And if they're born, that means there was a time at which they did not exist, and that gives us a good idea of why we might think they would pass away as well. So they're actually not immortal. He doesn't stop there. He continues. Another criticism of religion is that we have this natural explanation of why the gods were described as they were. That's available now. And so he does surveys and he finds that Thracians have gods that have their skin color. And that's common among all people. And he he talks about how if horses or cows had the ability to draw gods, they would draw them as horses or cows. That's, we have this tendency to create gods in our own image instead of the traditional theology of that being done the other way around. Xenophanes extended cultural criticism. He obviously was critical of the poets. And really, this is kind of an initiation of more of a formal philosophy of religion, right? He has arguments against the traditional religious beliefs, as we just saw with his second criticism. 
he continues with his topic of religion by introducing the idea of what is now sometimes called the philosopher's God, a God that has the full attributes that would be worthy of worship. So Xenophanes actually did not reject religious beliefs entirely. He spoke of one God. There is a little bit of controversy there, but most scholars agree that he's speaking of one God that is mentioned in one of the fragments. This God would be the greatest among all others, or maybe actually the only one. Right? And this God was identified with the ultimate basic stuff that was self-moving, imperishable, and the rational basis of the universe. Think similar to the logos of Heraclitus or even the Apiron of Anaximander. Now, the logos of Heraclitus is more um, non-natural, or we might say today supernatural. The Apiron was more of a natural thing, but both had these godlike personal attributes of providing a rational basis for the way things moved and acted in the universe. And so like an Aximander, the universe has this sense of justice to it. And that's due to the God that's providing that justice, right? The God's provided order to nature. And so he does not entirely reject the idea of gods. Instead, though, he rejects the Greek pantheon and suggests instead there is one God that has these attributes that then would be, metaphysically at least, worthy of worship. Finally, an emphasis on reason. So Xenophanes does some epistemology. He questioned the nature of knowledge, which is doing epistemology. And he says that we make progress in knowledge through inquiry. We need to investigate things. We need to do philosophy. Now, this is in contrast to the culture of the day because the Greeks thought that they were declining from, from an earlier idyllic state. They thought that once everything was basically perfect and things are slowly getting worse. But Xenophanes said that, no, we're actually getting better because of our knowledge increasing, because of our awareness and understanding the world increasing. So we're, we're actually improving in that sense. However, he did talk about limitations on this project. So he's not necessarily a skeptic, but he did sow the seeds of skepticism with his distinctions between mere opinion and knowledge. Now, those distinctions are very significant. So we have this relativity due to perception that hinders our attaining knowledge. He uses the example of saying that if we weren't familiar with honey, we would say that figs were much sweeter, right? This, there's this relativity of perception. And because of that, and because of our limitations, that hinders our attaining true knowledge. Now, that concept is very significant for Socrates and Plato. Again, though they are not skeptics, they acknowledge our great limitations in understanding the world around us through physical investigation through what we would call today science.